Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of An Introduction to the Art and Science of Chinese Tea Ceremony. Today, we're discussing Book 1, Chapter 4, Section 1, How Do Other Praxis Progress Their Technique? Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny and Ryan On. Hello, Pat. Hello, Ryan. Hello. Hey, Jason. I'd like to start today a little bit differently. What tea are you drinking, Pat? I'm drinking a Muja Tia Guanyin from a pretty well-known tea house in Taiwan. How strange. I'm drinking a Muja Tia Guanyin uh, from a nearly high mountain farm, also in Taiwan, not from a tea house. Ryan, how about you? I'm drinking some Korean green tea, uh, very kindly sent to all three of us uh, during the pandemic uh, last spring uh, by Master Hyoam in Korea. And so really greatly enjoying it. And it's really held up uh, almost one year later. Sure, you're looking forward to some fresh greens, just like the rest of us as well, Ryan. My first question, and I'll preface this question with the statement that this is an a different form of a chapteral argument because it sets up a framework for tops down and bottoms up driven progression, but does not talk about specific examples there. So beyond that, Pat, let's start with you. What did you think was missing from this chapter? Uh, as you had mentioned, you're setting up a framework. So I wouldn't say so much that I felt anything was uh, missing. Um, more so, I finished this chapter wanting uh, to know more, uh, wanting to have examples, more examples of uh, top-down or bottoms-up uh, evolution of a praxis. Um, and specifically, I, I was more interested in bottom-up, uh, thinking about how myself as a practitioner or part of a practicing group uh, can influence uh, the overall progression of, of a praxis. Um, but, you know, understandably, without that institutionalization, uh, it's harder to, to have examples of that. So I would just say, uh, yeah, as I got through, I was interested in learning more, uh, but didn't feel that there was anything specifically missing. Do you believe that you have the requisite capital, uh, any of the three types of capital, in order to affect the type of change that you would like to see uh, on Chinese tea ceremony? A uh, big fat no. Uh, so, you know, I read through um, that part of the chapter, that part of the uh, section, and uh, it reminded me uh, of a quote you've often used, right? The arts of the bourgeoisie, right, will remain the arts of the bourgeoisie because they have the formative experiences uh, to enjoy them, right, to propagate uh, or to spread uh, knowledge of such things. Um, so, yeah, as I, as I had read that, I, I really thought to myself, uh, no, I don't believe I have either the, the social, cultural, or economic capital at this point, um, but I think that's something we all work on building, right? Uh, whether that's our social capital uh, between us and other practitioners, uh, us and other schools of practice, uh, we're always trying to, uh, you know, build goodwill, uh, build good connections so that if, if we want to either learn from other groups uh, or influence them with our learning, um, we have the connection there to, to make that happen. Ryan, which of the three forms of capital do you believe have the greatest impact in the present day in affecting change, either top down or bottoms up? It's a great question. Probably social capital, really just the explosion of the internet has made that the case in many fields, um, those who have the eyes and ears of a great number of people and who can now do that at scale have an incredible amount of influence in the way that they have never had before. Um, so in that sense, you know, I think social capital is incredibly important um, and more disconnected from economic capital than it's ever been before. Um, so to use Japanese tea ceremonies as an example, Right, like the headquarters uh, or the wh whoever is in charge of a particular region for a motosenke or urasenke has a lot of both economic capital, at least historically, and social capital to decide what types of related arts would get funded, um, like uh, particular raku potters or a great local example of that is urasenke in Philadelphia and support local artists like Willie Singleton. Um, who makes chawans uh, locally. And it almost reminds me of, you know, Florence during the Renaissance where you had 
people who had incredible social and economic capital um, that could support those related arts. How do you think that social media has changed what it means to have social capital in today's world? Scale. You can communicate at a scale unlike we, ne we never have been able to before. And um, particularly English speakers. Um, you know, you can engage in conversations with people all over the world, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia. You know, we get to have a global conversation. Um, and also the, just the nature of distribution. I mean, you can buy wares directly from people in China. You can buy tea from New Zealand, right? That you could use to practice Kung Fu Cha. It's also incredibly global and connected in a way that it hasn't been before. And Pat, what do you think the ramifications are of social media uh, creating an avenue for social capital within tea ceremony? What do you see as the effects of, of that microphone? Well, I think uh, there's effects, positive and negative. Um, I think looking at how uh, social capital has been uh, developed specifically when I think of uh, specific schools or uh, vendors, even uh, there's a degree of uh, goodwill that always comes along with social capital uh, in that uh, often vendors sharing knowledge or information, whether that's via an Instagram post, a blog post, um, they're trying to drive uh, at least some some degree of connoisseurship or use of wares forward uh, through their their microphone, right? Their social media blog or what have you. So I think that there's there's been a lot of positive aspects because that goodwill is often towards guiding beginners or trying to show people just getting into the practice how they can uh, develop, especially in the early stages. I do think that there's also uh, some negatives to, to the microphone that is social media uh, as it relates to tea. Um, you do just have, you know, this uh, overwhelming abundance of people kind of just spamming, uh, you know, wares that they like, trying to sell uh, everything they possibly can through any social media platform. So uh, I get contacted uh, through DMs and through LinkedIn often as well, a lot too, uh, from suppliers, manufacturers, farmers probably a lot in part due to my the title and the company I work for, uh, less to do with just being a tea practitioner with an Instagram. Um, but I think there there is that darker side behind the goodwill where it does become just another means of reaching a consumer as quickly as possible. Uh, and the care for the consumer uh, starts to go out the window and it's just another way to reach a, a massive market. Uh, I, I think that's a great point. And you know, Jason, you had discussed discussed in this um, article that you know the progression and evolution is all, all very Darwinian, um, and sort of two things came to my mind, and one of them was cohesion. How do you prevent um, any practice um, from splintering? And exactly what Pat was saying, you know, sometimes I fear that social media and the internet in general makes it so that. Um, uh, you have these fragmented groups of people with different ideas, pooling from different principles, and possibly even coming to different conclusions, um, and that it lacks the cohesion that uh, the evolution of a normal practice would have naturally. You, you certainly do see that. You, you see that with individuals who claim that the mid-aged factory puer uh, is the best puer, uh, who, and who are purposely avoiding any of the more contemporary productions of single origin cakes uh, from smaller producers. Um, that's not a judgment valuation on that opinion, uh, right? But you're already see, beginning to see a, a splinter in, in defining of what is good and what is interesting and what should be promoted. So I think that how much of this that we attribute to social media or to the diffuse and uncentralized nature uh, of this praxis is, is one of the things that I think is most interesting to debate. And so following that track, and potentially changing the question a little bit, um, given uh, that you have all been in teaching roles before and given uh, that you've worked to promote and progress the praxis, what is an impact uh, that you would like to make in, in the future? 
not specifically here, but uh, on, on any future practitioners? Well, as with any Darwinian process or evolutionary process, you know, replication um, and you know, reproduction is incredibly important to find new practitioners. And it's that moment where someone decides, oh, I really love tea. And everyone has a different aha moment, but creating the set of circumstances um, for someone else to have that, I think is one, the pinnacle of phenomenology, the phenomenist approach and meta theory, which we've talked about previously. Um, but you know, I, I get the greatest sense of satisfaction when I can create those set of conditions to get other people extremely interested in tea. And I think part of it is even the conversation we're having now, um, which is you know we're, we're making public, but also in, in the future, more um, in-person events as well. Yeah, I just want to tack on to Ryan's answer there. Uh, I think that was beautiful. I, I love that answer, Ryan. I think the greatest contribution we can make as uh, tea practitioners, right, is to share our love uh, for tea. <laughs> Um, and so understanding uh, why other people or potentially new practitioners are interested in tea and trying to take that interest uh, and develop it and craft a path for them uh, so they can learn more about tea in a way that's important to them, um, that really you know, touches some part of their being um, and feels wholly connected uh, to them. Um, I, I think that's, that's the most important thing we can do and that really should be any good tea practitioner's purpose to spread, you know, love and, and quest for knowledge or to understand more uh, about tea, just to spread interest, right, of tea to, to the next generation. Ryan, looking ahead, do you think that you'll be a promoter of the top-down or bottoms-up approach? That's a great question. I think that institutionalizing the progression of Gong Fu Cha is the way to go the most successful modern day models um, of that. Um, I, I like their results more than sort of this um, grassroots approach, um, which feels a little more disorganized and you see those um, pockets of knowledge. And just to you know, directly call out a particular group, Global Tea Hut is incredibly successful at doing this, um, totally top down approach. Um, and they've built quite the following and, you know, we've all visited their center and uh, I think what they have established is really quite beautiful and, and you know, we are and remain friends with the, with the, the global tea hut broader community. Yeah. And even what we had at the Institute was also top down. Um, I think it's just a better way of organizing it. And I see no reason why you couldn't have pe multiple top down organizations all approaching tea from their own specific view and angle. Global Tea Hut is very spiritual focused and um, very focused on doing things with a lot of intent. I think at the Tea Institute, it was a little more experimental in terms of empiricism and, and research. Um, there's definitely room for different focus areas um, from institutionalized top-down approaches. And how is that not leading to its own sense of fragmentation? Oh, it is. It's just, it's, they're smaller fragments. Or would you say organized fragments? Yeah, organized fragments. I mean, you could say the same thing about Japanese tea. I mean, it's split into three prominent houses, uh, the Sen Senke, Moda Senke, Uda Senke, and uh, Musha Koji Senke. And then I believe even after that, you see further splintering. Um, so there's it doesn't prevent it from progressing forward in a coherent way where it can actually survive as a, a unified entity. Pat, same question to you. Uh, I, I have a very similar uh, answer to Ryan and definitely want to drive home that um, as far as the top down uh, perspective goes, um, I think it's totally okay to have uh, multiple institutional groups with slightly different aims that are all progressing the praxis in their own way. Uh, and I, I definitely don't see any arguments in the book uh, against this to this point. Um, I think where I want to be active is in both spaces though. Uh, I think it's good to be part of some group that is from top down driving forward the praxis uh, in a very structured way, which helps you move very quickly, I believe. Um, but I think it's important to maintain an active role in smaller groups, right? 
driving forward preferences or changes we want to see in the practice, maybe in those larger institutional groups, you know, through discussions or social capital, as you discuss uh, in the book. So I think, you know, as a practitioner, you want you want to be in both spaces. Ryan, you mentioned Chanayo, and Pat, you've spent quite a bit of time in Japan and have also practiced Chanayo. Do you see any evidence of stagnation or crystallization uh, within Chanayo? I think Chanayo is a wonderful example because uh, you do have so much uh, structured change that takes place. Um, you know, every Iemoto uh, or basically headmaster uh, of a branch or of a school uh, is allowed to make one change uh, in their lifetime to the practice or to any specific technique within the practice. So I think that structured avenue for change uh, is pretty powerful. But I think there's also uh, social changes, right? Modernization that happens around it and finds its way into the practice. Um, and as Ryan had mentioned, right, there's major groups that are known, uh, I think, internationally, um, but there's a ton of schools that exist in Japan that have very slightly different takes on the technique um, and that, you know, have their own interesting uh, angles of modernization that are that are taking uh, shape. I don't think I have a concrete example off the top of my head right now, um, but you are seeing uh, you know, more interesting forms of change taking place through modernization and social pressures on the practice. I write in this chapter that Chanayo is more easy to satirize than Kung Fu Cha, specifically because of that crystallization or potentially even that sense of stagnation, that the praxis as it exists is the praxis that will always exist because the change is so slow. Without going into a value judgment on Chanayo, why do you think that Chanayo is easier to satirize? Or do you disagree that it is easier to satirize? I, I definitely agree. It's much easier to satirize. And I believe that that's just because of the high degree of codification. Um, and I believe that, you know, Japan uh, as a country has done such great nation building work and tying in uh, the Japanese tea ceremony into uh, really uh, the backbone or a really strong part of, you know, their cultural ethos. So uh, a lot of what you see through Japanese tea ceremony is this ideal of uh, motenashi, which uh, very loosely translates into hospitality, right? So it's uh, this connection between the host and guest. Uh, which is really the ultimate goal uh, as you're going through Japanese tea ceremonies to establish this connection and to have this very fleeting ephemeral moment, right? That is not replicatable, uh, Ichigo Ichie. I think because of all of the structure, nation building, codification around the tea ceremony and the hundreds of years of, of practice history writing on it, uh, it's just so much easier to satirize versus Gong Fu Cha, which you've got, you know, people over here, you know, in the States doing something totally different than people in Russia uh, doing something different than the, you know, Chinese practitioners who are doing something different than the Taiwanese practitioners. Uh, it's just so uh, splintered, as we had been mentioning earlier, uh, it's much harder to find a single image of Gong Fu Cha and then make fun of that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything Pat said. And, and just from a different angle as well, um, it is incredibly rigid, but it's easy to satirize too because, because of that rigidity, but it, it plays into levels of practice um, because there's a lot of moves and a lot of protocols that have a very specific reason behind them. And until you've studied a very long time, you know, the answers slowly reveal themselves why those rigid rules exist. I remember very distinctively about one year in studying a motosenke, there's this one move where you have to put your hand under the ball versus over the ball. And I didn't realize this until it, everyone was in full kimono the next day after we were practicing. And you can't go over the ball because the kimono has this large flap over your arm. It would be a physically impossible move, but that's entirely unapparent um, when you're practicing, you know, with a t-shirt on. Um, so that's just one small example, but the whole ceremony, I feel like, is built off of think very practical considerations. But until you've reached a certain level of practice, it does not become obvious why you do it that way. Right. I, I absolutely love that answer. I think uh, maybe we both want to turn this around on Jason. Uh, if you were going to satirize Gong Fu Cha, uh, how would you do that? I love this question and 
Uh, now I feel like we're going to have to execute on this. Uh, but I would go with smaller and smaller wares, particularly smaller and smaller cups. Uh, some time ago, uh, in um, a mix of procurement to creation or gifting, uh, me and another individual uh, attempted to design some silver teacups. And of course, silver conducts heat very well. So what would you? Why would you want a silver teacup? You want a silver kettle or a single silver teapot? But for green tea, making them very small you could you could use a, a silver teacup and these silver teacups um, for a variety of reasons came out um, they were supposed to be small but they came out much smaller uh, than we had intended and so if you've ever seen those little minchuan late ching um, blue and white just people's wear um, that hold I don't know, 10, 15 milliliters, these were about half that size. So it was a, a little drop uh, of tea could go into, into each one. And so I, I would keep one sometimes in my pocket uh, and when attending um, someone's, someone's brewing uh, back at the Institute or a more formal chashi, take out my little tiny, uh, maybe seven milliliter cup and put that off to the side and just say, put a drop of tea in there and sip out of that. And everyone would say, what is that? And I would just put it on my thumb and say, it's a silver thimble. Uh, <laughs> um, and the thing was that it was believable enough. I was drinking out of it, but at the, at the same time, what, what was that? So um, I, I would go with smaller and smaller wares as the, as the way to satirize uh, Gong Fu Cha, the most, the, most, the, the most readily available way that comes to mind. And it's the I, pinnacle I, of Gong Fu Cha. Uh, one drip of tea for you, one drip for Ryan, one drip for myself. Pin Cha achieved right there. Three three drips total. Uh, I think we will have to, to set up a, a chashi uh, and, and, and share with the listeners the, the results of this. We have time for one last question. Pat, where do you think this chapter will de- generate contention or debate in the tea world? I believe that, you know, some tea practitioners uh, would find the parallel traditions of coffee or wine uh, to be uh, too far removed from tea, Uh, whether or not they're historical beverages, uh, they don't quite have the same uh, ceremonial aspects or the same, uh, I would say, historical and cultural relevance or tie-in that tea has, and specifically Chinese tea, to make that same comparison about them having uh, top-down cultivation. Uh, so the uh, debate that I see is uh, what might work for coffee or wine uh, or even Japanese tea, uh, but more so coffee and wine as far as cultivating uh, the praxis uh, may not, and in some people's case, they can't imagine how it would um, have the same effect or be useful for Chinese tea. Um, so that's what I see as you know one point of contention in this article As Ryan had mentioned before, you really just kind of structured a framework here. So I don't see a ton to debate, but uh, if I had to pick one point, that's what I see. There could be a lack of relevancy to a lot of tea lovers. I mean, you don't need, this is not requisite. Caring about whether or not Chinese tea ceremony exists is not requisite to being a tea lover or someone who appreciates the connoisseurship of drinking tea. Um, So I do think that this is, not focused on people who just love tea. It, it, it's a subgroup of that. May we all have the leisure to idly stand by as the praxis dies. So I, I think I can definitely agree and see, uh, you know, what Ryan's point is. I think at some level, and maybe I, I believe this applies earlier in your practice, at some level, you're just interested in tasting different teas, exploring, you know, the world and opportunities that tea has to offer. Uh, but you reach a point where it really becomes important that this information is shared with others, that there's a community developed around tea uh, within your life, right? It becomes a community that you're attached to. Uh, and you want to see uh, the practice, uh, whether for better or worse, um, you want to see it change, evolve, and continue. Um, and so while maybe um, those who have just started their tea journey uh, might find this a bit erudite and metaphysical, I think those who have been in tea for a while, and maybe even those specifically who are much older and are concerned, right? Um, after they, you know, pass on, uh, they have no one to hand off their tea wares to. 
Uh, maybe none of their relatives, children, grandchildren are even interested in tea. Um, and I, I think there is certainly a group that's that's very concerned about the future of tea. Uh, so I, I do believe it's important, uh, given our relatively young age and the timeline horizon in front of us, um, to really promote tea uh, as a tradition to try and spread uh, the knowledge and appreciation of the culture surrounding it uh, now and going forward in the future uh, so that we see the praxis continue. And I think that that will be the last word. Thank you for everyone for joining us in this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversations. Please join us again for a discussion of the next chapter, the future of Chinese tea ceremony, top down.